Welcome to another episode of the CPG Guys podcast. Our co-hosts, Sri Rajagopalan and Peter V.S. Bond, explore how brands and retailers engage with consumers online, in-store, and everywhere in between. And now, here are Sri and Peter. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the CPG Guys podcast. I'm PVSB, a.k.a. the Feedback CPG Guy, and my subject matter expertise revolves around brand loyalty, CRM, digital shelf content, retail, customer data, and insights. And my co-host, he's the Opinion CPG Guy, uh, an expert at branding, D2C, unified commerce, retail media, and marketplaces. Normally, I welcome him to join me on this podcast, but... Unfortunately, Shri is otherwise occupied, so I'm going to be going at it alone. Shri, sorry you couldn't join us today, but I know you're going to miss this one because it's a great conversation. Before we get to our guest, I want to remind all of our audience that our content, including our series on profitability, our Women's Leaders series, our Q1 Founder series, all that's available by visiting cpgguys.com, and it's all free, which is a pretty good price for anyone. I mean, who, everyone can afford free, right? And our content is also on the show driven by our audience, so we want your feedback. The best way you can tell us about things you want us to talk about or people who you want to join on the podcast, well, just go to ratethispodcast.com slash cpgguys, leave us a review and a rating, uh, and we read those and we take them to consideration when we start scheduling out what we're going to do on the podcast. We also encourage you to go to LinkedIn. In the search bar, search for CPG Guys, find our page, and just follow us, because we publish a lot of great content, again, all free, and it's the best way that we can keep in touch with you. All right, as many in this audience know, I spent a transformative part of my professional career working at Dunhumby, the customer data science company. During my tenure there, our guest was elevated to the role of CEO. He was actually the first hire of the founders and was instrumental in Dunhumby's growth as a loyalty powerhouse. He spent 25 years there. Now, slightly over a year ago, he joined TCC Global as CEO. His company helps retail partners to encourage, recognize, and reward loyalty behavior through insight-driven marketing platforms that focus on two key outcomes, profitable sales growth and ultimately long-term brand engagement. He's an inspiring leader and a remarkable order. That's my opinion and the opinion of many others. He's coming to us from the UK today. Please join me in welcoming Simon Hey, Simon, tremendous honor to have you on the podcast. How are you doing today? Great. Thank you, Peter. It's always a privilege and pleasure to work with you and uh, obviously great to be back talking again. Great. That's terrific, Simon. Uh, before we get into the questions, if you don't mind, could you let our audience know uh, where they can find TCC Global Online because they love to multitask and they like to research while they're listening? Sure. They can find us at www.tccglobal.com and hopefully enjoy the experience and the information there and obviously always happy to get feedback too. Great. That's wonderful. And I gave a little overview of what TCC Global does. Is there anything you want to add to that? Well, Peter, you understand loyalty, so it's it's pretty hard to, to beat your, your descriptions and uh, your view of the world. But yeah, we, as you said, we're, we're about growing sales, which is the short term effect, but earning loyalty, building loyalty and changing the brand engagement of, the, of shoppers, too. And we do that for uh, for, well, sort of hundreds of retailers around the world every year. So let's just dig right in, because I know we've got a lot to talk about. I was looking at the news yesterday. Uh, Albertsons reported that it's Q4 digital sales were up 282 percent. Most of the retailers had really banner years. Uh, I would sure love your thoughts on what changes you are seeing in the U.S. grocery space relative to loyalty, which is the mechanism they ideally use to keep and, and grow the business with their most, most loyal shoppers. Yeah, look, it's a, it's a great question, Peter, and I, and I think we're at a, a bit of a moment of inflection and a moment of change because... Of course, there are exceptional reasons behind the, the sales growth that we've seen in recent months and over the last year or so. But actually, what we've seen is, is, is decreasing engagement in the loyalty mechanics and fuel rewards in, is in a lot of retailers. It's been around for a long, old period of time, but it's really not engaging many customers these days. And of course, the loyalty program that doesn't engage customers 
isn't really doing an awful lot to drive the outcomes and the behaviours that you want. And therefore, retailers are looking at different solutions. How do we get engagement through physical rewards, digital rewards, exper experiential rewards? And, and how do we put customers in control? Because ultimately, you know, they, they've got some degree of choice and a vote in this. And we're seeing more of that type of activity taking place. That's very helpful. That's terrific. So w I know from, from my time that one of the primary mechanisms, certainly in the U.S., that, that in, played into overall loyalty was this concept of a fuel rewards program. The more you purchase, discounts you get on fueling your car either at a station that was in the parking lot or in a partner fuel uh, retailer that you could take your car to. How does TCC fit into this kind of a mechanism for driving loyalty? Well, so sometimes we're working alongside it. Sometimes we're working instead of it. And it's, it's really about working out what's the economics for both the retailer and for, for the shopper. So realistically, we can be very complementary to those types of, you know, call them always on programs, partly because, as I say, it's, it's generally you know, low tens of percentage of customers are actually using it. So that leaves 70, 80 percent of customers not redeeming their rewards, not engaging in the in the loyalty mechanics. You know, we're much more about the uh, the loyalty program that has a, a start date and an end date. And we try to create something compelling and interesting in between. And, you know, that drives real behavior, real outcomes. And I think, you know, if you think of the attention deficit disorder we all suffer from these days, that then the idea of having the same loyalty program for 15 years, the same communications, the same branding, it's just not the type of excitement and stimulation and reward that most of us are looking for these days. So so something needs to be different in in the loyalty world, both today and tomorrow. You know, Simon, for people of uh, my age, who were in the U.S. around the turn of the millennia. I was working at the time at a, uh, a startup venture inside of a pretty successful dot-com. Not many people remember that Priceline.com launched in late 1999, early 2000, a short-lived grocery and gasoline division. The concept was name your own price for groceries or name your own price for gasoline. And what always fascinated me was, and the reason I mentioned this is, is the fuel aspect of it. You could save $20, $30 on groceries, but for some reason, people, because of the commodity nature of gasoline, they got more excited about saving 10 cents a gallon. And when you averaged it all out on a $15 tank, it was a buck 50. That just got their attention. It's just a little crazy. I, sometimes I, I, I'm fascinated by how powerful uh, things like fuel rewards are. Hey, I want to move over to corporate social responsibility, because that's certainly something that many companies are very fixated on right now. How do you see grocers' uh, CSR initiatives playing into their loyalty uh, rewards offerings? Well, I think many of them, you know, they, they want to do the right thing. They want to make these big CSR commitments. But of course, it's hard, right? We're, we're going to face lots of hard choices as we head, head towards net zero by 2050 or whatever the targets that uh, you know, various nations are going to sign up for. And I think the thing that we can help them do is, you know, through physical rewards, through digital, through experiential, through partnership, through community. You know, we run campaigns that give money to charities like Save the Children or the World Wildlife Fund. We educate kids about food waste, about ocean plastics. We take uh, goods out of, you know, we take uh, plastic bottles and we make them into ranges of luggage. And we can do that in a circular economy way for, for some retailers in some countries. Uh, but, you know, it becomes a really practical way for, for it to come alive. We've run a recent campaign in Europe where we've given rewards to community sports clubs. Uh, and with COVID, those, those sports clubs were on their knees. They were struggling to stay in business. And we've put you know, millions of rewards, you know, millions of, uh, of dollars worth of equipment into their hands. And that's kept them alive. And it's had an extraordinary su success and, and profile. You know, great for shoppers, great for the retailer, and, and great for building loyalty. And it, it's just a, 
it's a way to make uh, you know CSR real, which I think is where many retailers and brands have struggled. That's terrific, Simon. I I, I agree. I think it's been a very important part of helping our communities work through the uh, devastating implications of the COVID pandemic. Simon, I, I know that TCC Global's go-to-market model is predicated upon helping retailers build compelling loyalty models. But of course, those retailers are selling more often than not big national branded goods. So how do CPG partners play a role in this loyalty ecosystem and the mechanisms that you've created? Well, look, Peter, I think in our, our past, we've done a lot of work to increase and foster collaboration between brands, the CPGs and the retailer. And to some degree, we're going through a similar journey at TCC. We've traditionally seen the retailer as the main and core focus of our business. And of course, CPGs can be beneficiaries because the, uh, you know, as sales increase, they sell more of their key products. But of course, you can come sometimes get into that, uh, you know, let's call it the funding dialogue between the, between the CPG uh, and the retailer. We're finding, particularly with things like uh, digital mechanics and gamification, for example, really interesting and new and different ways to have a core campaign, but to really involve CPGs alongside it to use you know, brand opportunities, uh, you know, kids games, adult games, those types of things, spin and win or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. The things that really you know, allow targeting, personalization, you know, relevance, uh, but also for the retailer, they add excitement, of course, to the core program. But for the brand, it allows them to put, you know, propositions, promotions, offers in front of the right customers. And so, of course, we get that wonderful, you know, collective impact on loyalty. Great for brands, great for retailers, and great for shoppers. And of course, they all build off each other's excitement and engagement to further grow sales. Thank you, Simon. You mentioned that TCC has been operating for three decades. From your perspective uh, at a higher level, is that a blessing that you have all this experience or is there some curse associated with having been rooted in much more of the traditional retail um, in-store kind of promotional experience? Look, history is always both a, both a blessing and a curse, isn't it? So it's how, yeah. do we, how do we take advantage of all the great things that we've learned? You know, we have a, a database of something like 8,000 of these loyalty programs that we've run for retailers around the world. And of course, knowing at a you know, week by week, day by day, store by store level, you know, sometimes ultimately customer by customer level, how we've engaged, what works, what didn't how campaigns grew, what made them effective, what made, you know, what separates the great from the, uh, from the bad ones is, is an incredibly powerful asset that helps us in our, in our business, because ultimately our ability to forecast these campaigns and therefore get the right amount of offers to the right customers at the right time is a pretty key and important part of, part of our success. But of course, any business that, that uh, is around for 30 years also creates its own, its own legacy along the way. And sometimes that's powerful and sometimes that can pull you back. Uh, yeah, we, we've we've definitely probably taken a bit of time to really recognize and understand how digital amplifies the core programs. You know, like many companies, right, you start off being a little bit of afraid of it and then you realize how powerful it can be. And your know, digital digital transformation, digital change is not an easy for isn't easy for any big company. So, uh, you know, we've definitely been pushing that journey forward. And, you know, we're using much more data now, much more digital and you know, using all of these pieces to work together. So it's really, as you say, how do we build on the strengths, but then how do we also recognize where do we need to, to live more in the future? All right, let's dig a little deeper into the pandemic for a second, Simon. From your perspective, and I know you watch this, can you give us some of your thoughts on what are some of the major changes that the pandemic has brought upon the grocery industry, not only in the US, but just the world over? Yeah, I think it's it's been incredibly consistent. And uh, I don't think we we have, or I don't think I have much insight for your for your audience being what they already know, of course, is this huge growth in, in the online space. Uh, the, the people who could who have models that could adapt to that and at least flex their growth have, have of course been bigger winners than those that have more fixed capacity. 
I'm sure there's you know an army of, of retail CEOs or past retail CEOs now kicking themselves saying if only I knew what was going to happen what would have I done differently 10 years ago because of course the ability to you know turn this on quickly is is pretty hard I think really that for me that the biggest questions are uh, you know of course what's amazing is I can only think of a couple of markets around the world where the food supply chain has really struggled and it's become an issue in terms of feeding the population so for the majority of grocery change in both developed and developing worlds and countries yeah you know, they've actually fed the population and fed everyone else right because of course all the food that we used to consume out of home is now consumed at home and I think when we talk about you know stars of the uh, uh, of the pandemic and of course we talk about the vaccinations and uh, and of course the amazing healthcare workers actually I think the food industry has done an amazing job too because you know, I can count as to say one hand the places in the world where where it's become an issue, and yet we've uh, had seen all these seismic changes and kept the wheels on and still kept the products on the shelves and and everything else. So that's that really is an incredible story and an incredible credit to to everyone who's been involved. And of course, I'm sure many of them are listening to this program. So you know, my thanks and your thanks to to them and all their colleagues colleagues for that. I think the key question is is what's going to happen, right? Because of course, as the world opens up. Uh, we're going to get faced with this. You know, actually, all of a sudden, we have choices again about where we spend money, where we buy our food, where we consume our food, which are the habits that are going to stay and which are the habits that are going to revert. And I think I've yet to see what I think is what I would class, classify as enough focus on, OK, how are we going to keep what we've got? Right. What are the things we're going to put in place to, to continue to you know, keep this loyalty, having earned it? Uh, because if it all slips away pretty quickly, we're going to see some pretty sick numbers, having just seen some pretty amazing ones. Yeah, I think about the fact that the genie's out of the bottle, Simon, particularly as it relates to so many people adopting online as a mechanism for conducting transactions and the experience that they have engaging online, realizing that they have access to so much more content than they ever had in the store. And once they go back into the store, you know, I, I constantly say this to retailers, if you're not starting to think about the, ex, the experience in store and how you can leverage digital capabilities to enhance that, if you don't do that, there are a lot of competitors, uh, you know, here in the US, there's one in Seattle, I can forget what its name is, but they're more than happy to deliver content to your customers via these devices as they walk through your store aisle. So in any event, really interesting. Uh, you started, you, you know, you started in the world of data and loyalty, as I discussed, uh, where you and I worked together. I joined a, a number of years after you did. And then you've circled back again with TCC. Um, when you think about the early stages, I think it was the late 90, uh, late 80s, early 90s when you started, how has loyalty changed over time from your perspective? I think it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. I think it's, um, it's to some degree, loyalty hasn't changed for decades. You could even argue centuries back to the days of the, uh, the Portuguese retailers or, or, or tradespeople who used to put plates in the crates of tea as, a, as an early mechanic, right? And then, of course, we had the, uh, in the UK, we had the, the co-op dividend or Divi card, which gave money back to shoppers in the, in the 19th century. So, Many of the principles have been around for a long time. I guess what we, we really did with Dunhumby in the, in, in the early 1990s was start to, you know, to create the electronic versions of those programs. And of course, more importantly, to use the data that came out of it. So the loyalty program was great for customers, rewarding, engaging, personalized coupons, all of those good things. But of course, what we did more importantly was actually transform the business in the background around the customer. You know, the pricing, the promotions, the store layout, uh, the communications, the brand, the loyalty program itself. You know, all of those we, we empowered and energized and, and changed with data. And of course, we created these wonderful circular loyalty effects where customers are getting rewarded, creating better shopping experience, more relevant communications. Therefore, they engage more deeply. Therefore, they get rewarded more. And of course, that creates an amazing uh, you know, thing for both shoppers and, and for the retailer. 
Now, of course, data is now much more, <laughs> well, much more of it in many more places. So, you know, to some degree, that angle ha has changed. Uh, but I think the, yeah, you know, the principles of loyalty that we're still trying to earn still apply, right? So, you know, what's relevant now? How is it engaging? As we discussed earlier, shoppers have become much more short termist, right? We all have many more distractions on our plate in our in our lives, in our choices of channels and everything else. And therefore, we've got to work hard to continue to keep up, keep relevant uh, and put choices in into shoppers hands. But as you say, when you explain loyalty to anyone who runs a business, everyone goes, yeah, that's what I do. Right? I try to keep my customers happy, recognize my best ones and keep them coming back. So the principles are pretty consistent and still hold strong. You know, Simon, you're on point about the data aspect, the ability to process so much data from customers and segment customers based upon their shopping habits. When I think about what's happened over the last decade or so since I got into the space, I think when I first joined, most of the focus was on was driven by offers, right? It was here's a discount or here's a here's an offer. And it really was about that value savings. One of the things I've started to see emerge is segmentation becomes much more refined, is that you identify ultimately a group of shoppers who are not necessarily driven by the savings aspect of it. They're driven much by more by experience. So I'm finding that retailers and brands that understand that and understand that, say, for a someone who's a, a beauty shopper that is really focused on things that are on trend, sending them uh, a message, not with a discount, because they often are the people that are least susceptible to, to discount offers, but sending them a video that shows them how to apply a particular type of makeup or cosmetic or skincare, that that actually can drive more measurable sales than just giving them a 50 cent coupon. I think, I think we're moving much more in that direction in, instead of just quickly identifying and going for the the discount value. I think that's a major change I see as well. Hey, um, one last question for you, Simon. When I, when I think about imposing uh, loyalty mechanisms for retailers, I'd love your thoughts on are there certain types of retailers where loyalty is not applicable or only applicable for certain types of customers? And how do, how do you at TCC go about helping a retailer partner identify the, the appropriate opportunity for loyalty to work with their customer base? Yeah, I think there's, there's, um, there's very few businesses where loyalty doesn't work in some form, in some way. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that uh, yeah, economically, TCC have models for every retailer in every situation, right? To, mm -hmm. Uh, to some cases, the, the frequency of the transaction, the basket size, the cost of the reward, or the interval, you know, obviously the, the very long timescale products where you don't see a customer for years on end. But even then, of course, you want to create the word, or the word of mouth engagement and those types of things. So there might not be a, a loyalty model or loyalty reward per se, but the loyalty principles hold true. And your previous comments about the experiential reward are absolutely right, which is, yeah, we've probably got sort of fixated on price and points and points mean money, but uh, it's a much deeper understanding of customers to say, actually, if we put something in their hands that helps them live a better life or a healthier life or make better beauty choices or they feel informed or they, they uh, feel engaged, they feel special. You know, all of these emotional things that we can create with loyalty programs and you know, you sort of mentioned about why I found myself back in the, the global loyalty space again. I, I just think it's really exciting with some of the things that, you know, we're doing at TCC to, you know, we're putting, we're putting products and experiences in the hands of you know, hundreds of millions of shoppers around the world. And, and some of them are using rewards still in their kitchens today that we might have put there, you know, three, four, five, even 10 years ago. And, you know, when you, when you reward it with someone and they're still, they're still using it five years or 10 years later in their house every day, You've got a pretty interesting, uh, you know, that's a loyalty mechanic that lasts uh, and an emotion that lasts. And, you know, so I think when we're trying to create emotional ties between retailers and their shoppers, loyalty always has a role to play. As I said, it doesn't mean we've got a mechanic for every occasion and we can't solve every problem. But, yeah, I think the loyalty thinking takes every retailer you know, to a very, very positive place. I want to remind our audience that 
All of our content is available for free. That's our audio podcast. You can watch us on YouTube if you really want to. Uh, our documents around profitability, a link to the podcast that Sheree and I love to listen to when we're not listening to ourselves. Uh, that sounds a little narcissistic, but yeah, we do occasionally listen to our own podcast. It is true. I, I will admit to that. But in any event, you can just go to cpgguys.com and it's all there for free. And of course, give us your feedback. Let us know what you want to learn more about. Just go to ratethispodcast.com slash cpgguys. Write a review and while you're there, Give us a rating, because you know I'm all about the rating business. You can give us any number you want. My personal favorite number is five, but hey, uh, who am I to tell you what to do? So I'm going to put in the liner, the digital liner notes of this podcast, links to TCC Global and to Simon's profile on LinkedIn. Simon, thank you so much for joining uh, me today. I'm sorry Shri couldn't join us as well, but uh, what I do want to do is offer you the opportunity whenever you have something new to talk about you think is relevant you're always welcome on this podcast thank you for joining me today well, Pleasure. it's been an absolute pleasure thanks very much for your time and uh, yeah pleasure to speak to you again all righty so thanks everyone for joining us in this episode and we do hope you join us for a future episode of the cpg guys podcast goodbye thank you peter uh,